highly skilled professionals are constantly on the move to pursue better working and living conditions. And sometimes that journey takes them across the world, leaving a gaping hole that stunts growth for many Asian economies. This week on CNA Correspondent, we find out what it takes to make them stay. Lose Laura, not her real name, is leaving for Australia in July, where she's received an invitation for permanent residency. It was a decision she set on for two years. The political issue is that the government like many in her generation, Laura found herself at a crossroads after the social unrest. The once vocal and often diverse civil society scene deemed under the Beijing-imposed national security law. Drawn by the immigration pathways which the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia offered, Hong Kong residents started to leave. Quality of life it's not just locals. Foreigners make up 10% of Hong Kong's population. And when COVID-19 hit, the prolonged pandemic restrictions added to the exodus. We saw that spell out in the rental market. Now here, for instance, in the expat enclave of Discovery Bay, luxury rents continued to slide, dropping 2.4% in the last quarter of 2022, as demand falls while tenants leave. Before the pandemic, peak moving season usually takes place during the school break, from June to August. Santa Fe relocation, for instance, handles about 15 moves a day then, but as talk of a citywide lockdown soared last year, the company ended up running 20 moves a day over a longer period of five months. So usually in our business, um, inbound relocation, outbound would be 50-50 usually pre-pandemic. And then this has slightly started to shift, like I said, towards the end of 2020, and it really peaked in 2022. So probably from January to September 2022, we probably had 90% outbound versus 10% inbound. Chief Executive John Lee had pledged to raise the city's competitiveness when he took office, a goal that China said was pivotal to the development of the Greater Bay Area. With about 140,000 people dropping out of Hong Kong's workforce in the last two years, the heat is on. The city rolled out an aggressive talent trawling campaign last October, calling for graduates from the top 100 universities or those who have an annual salary of about 320,000 US dollars. Under the scheme, they can come to Hong Kong without any job offer. As of February, 92% of the nearly 8,400 applicants got through. The Immigration Department says it doesn't collect industry-specific data, but recruiters are seeing demand for jobs in the financial sector. I think given the borders has opened back, there's more and more queries, over 100 queries is happening like in the past few weeks I'm having right now. But comparing to COVID time, when, when the borders locked, people are more reluctant in moving around. Financial is still the main bread and butter in Hong Kong. So I think the financial will pick up first. And eventually, once the financial market has picked up, there's more business for, the, for consulting, IT. He says seasoned candidates have shown more interest in moving to Hong Kong since it's easier to get a work visa with more years of experience. Some who've left the city are starting to have a change of heart. When everybody started to realise that most of the COVID restrictions were going to be lifted, then we start to have most of our corporate clients approach us and tell us that we start to 
have candidates and employees moving back to Hong Kong. So the last two months, I would say that, for example, our immigration business, uh, where we apply for the work permit for employees, has increased by more than 25%. The answer could also lie further downstream. Already, more non-local students are enrolling in Hong Kong universities. Immigration tracked a 24% increase in 2021 from the previous year. Majority are from the mainland. Other foreign students also recorded a moderate increase. But there's been a three-year drop in those staying on after graduation. So retention is on the cards. We do emphasize on our multidisciplinary, multi-center, um, you know, multinational collaborations. And we do have strong networks in research as well as teaching. So that is attractive for um, students who wish to come back as a postgraduate and for more experienced researchers who wish to come back for more senior positions uh, the packages are attractive um, and they may be they may have support um, to set up their labs dr chan's phd student jessica shami is among a handful who's staying on after landing a job at a pharmaceutical firm still the job hunt wasn't the easiest it's relatively challenging in the sense that when I was looking for that example at job ads, um, a lot of them do ask for you to be, uh, to be able to speak Cantonese and some actually ask for you to be even uh, able to write and read Chinese, I would say. So yeah, partially I would say I got lucky in that sense, but I also think that the industry is moving towards being more open to foreigners. Jessica, who's from Jordan, is two years away from receiving PR status in Hong Kong. As an international student, she also qualifies for the IANG visa, which allows her to remain in the city for a year after graduation. The government has since extended that limit to two years, giving students more flexibility to scout for jobs. There is a representation of Asia in general in Hong Kong, as a, in, in, in a smaller scale. And then, of course, the proximity to other countries in Asia is also very ideal. So like, I got to an insight into a lot of cultures because I have friends from so many different places. These policies could be the key to stem the exodus, but the solve lies in keeping the city open. After all, there's a pulse to Hong Kong that's only starting to beat again after these turbulent years. Young, ambitious and keen to leave. For two years, Pratik Maan has had one goal, to move his family permanently out of India. The 32-year-old is hoping to do just that by the end of this year, along with his wife and their two-month-old baby. Kman is considered well off here, but he says he has struggled to establish his own career. I have applied for a couple of companies uh, wherein uh, I was not even, uh, I mean, I did not get through. What he couldn't get in India, he found more than 10,000 kilometers away in Canada. Man has a job offer from a Canadian tech company to serve as its vice president for marketing. He will earn about 15% more than what he would take home here in India in a similar position. But it took Pratik a while to convince his wife to agree to the move. I was deadly against it. And I know Pratik since before marriage. So we never had thought that we'll go abroad because everything is settled here, never ever. I think the first one is uh, the pollution in, in our country. I think it's getting pathetic year by year. Yeah. So uh, for a better quality of life for my daughter, who's got to turn two months old. So I think it's a, better, it's a good decision for us. For the couple, picking Canada was easy. As it struggles with an aging population, the country has been very welcoming of immigrants. Canada took in a record number of permanent residents last year, more than 431,000 of them, as it faces a severe labour shortage. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government says it intends to continue to, quote, welcome historic numbers of newcomers. Pratik and his family hope to be part of that influx, but first he needs to wade through tons of paperwork to get there. 
Many would-be immigrants turn to the likes of Vikas Chaudhary. For nearly a decade, his company has helped Indians get permanent residency in Western countries such as Canada and Australia. They advise applicants on the best route to take, help with the paperwork and tests, and also help them find accommodation once they move. For Canada, younger, more qualified people are likely to get through quicker, but most of those coming to Vikas's company tend to be older, between the ages of 30 and 40. उसको ये लगता है कि इनको तो बाहर भेज नहीं था इससे अच्छा कि हम पीआर पे चले जाते हैं तो हमारा वो पर्पस भी फुलफिल हो जाएगा और हम भी अपने बच्चों के साथ रह लेंगे लेकिन इनकी एज इतनी बन जाती है तब तक कि इनके एज के पॉइंट्स नहीं हो पाते तो वो आते हैं उनको मालूम है कि अगर वो पी आर जा रहे तो उनको मिनिमम वेजेस तो वहाँ के अकॉर्डिंग मिलेगा तो एक को कोई मिनिमम वेजेस पर अपना डोमेन छोड़ के किसी और डोमेन में भी काम करेगा तो दूसरे वाले को एक सर्वाइवल थोड़ा टाइम मिल जाएगा पीरियड मिल जाएगा वो अपने फील्ड में जॉब ढूंढ सकता है इट्स वॉट प्रीति रवि एंड अनिरोध सुब्रमण्यम डेड Three years ago, they moved out of Delhi, leaving behind friends, family, and two well-paying jobs. They got to Toronto and started looking for work, living on their savings for the first few months. Welcome to my sleepover. The couple, both MBA graduates, were even prepared to work lower-paying blue-collar jobs if nothing else came through. We both worked in startups, and I think uh, one of the big factors in that was uh, work-life balance. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we, you know, we like the challenge of a startup. You know, we, I guess, like to work as well. But the plan for us was to start a family. Just being available 24 hours of the day, 365. didn't seem ideal we were of course very concerned about you know uh, getting the right job in our field um uh, we were lucky we uh, we landed our first job in canada you know within two months of moving here uh, but having said that we both had to take considerable pay cuts uh, in our first jobs their daughter was born in canada two years ago and this month they both renounced their indian citizenship formally becoming canadian nationals what is that is it cricket yeah. yeah india doesn't allow dual citizenship if it did the couple says they wouldn't have given up their indian passports for many indian nationals like them finding a job and settling abroad is about making that choice between holding on to your indian identity and embracing the new life you build abroad Indians leaving the country for greener pastures is not a new trend. According to the latest data from the UN's World Migration Report, there are more than 281 million people living outside the countries in which they were born. Of these migrants, more than 40% of them come from Asia, and India outranks every other country in the world with the largest number of Indians currently living outside the country. Among them, 18 million people of Indian origin are now living abroad permanently, forming the world's largest emigrant population. In the 1990s, there was a big focus on attracting Indian talent back, part of the government's efforts to open up the economy and entice big firms to set up shop here. Experts say it worked, but now the government's own data shows that in just the last decade, there's been an 86% jump in Indians giving up their passports. Indians moving out of the country can be good news for the Indian economy. They send back a record amount of remittances, more than the nationals of any other country in the world. Last year, 89 billion dollars came into the country this way, according to the Reserve Bank of India. but experts question if the economic benefits are compensation enough for the loss incurred by this exodus tragedy is that our development trajectory has not generated enough productive employment and so we're not using the brains we have are there steps that governments can take to retain this talent dramatically increasing our health education and basic social services tripling that kind of spending because these are all job generating things directly and then they have indirect employment effects when you get that kind of dynamic employment multiplier then you get a demand for jobs at all levels When the issue was raised in parliament the government said a successful prosperous and influential diaspora is an asset for India 
and that the country stands to gain a lot from tapping these diaspora networks. It is, however, working with foreign universities, hoping they'll set up campuses in India, and this will at least stop students from moving away. India has been called the only bright spot globally this year. As Western nations fight a looming recession, it's set to become the world's fastest growing economy. But beneath that growth story is a hemorrhage that the country will have to address. India's future relies on the might of its working age population and giving them a reason to stay on. Dr. Ku Yung Kien served with the Malaysian Health Ministry for almost a decade. But when it came to his career progression, he found that his choices were limited. Malaysia was, um, for me personally, uh, it was hard to try to um, get into a um, specialization program or master's program in Malaysia that I wanted to, um, which is understandable, I think, because um, in Malaysia we practice um, service first requirement. So, you know, we get sent to departments or hospitals where there are um, lacking of um, doctors or, you know, junior doctors. Um, so, um, but there came to a point that I needed to decide and um, I thought of something to do uh, wider than just um, doctor-patient um, treatment or relationship. Dr. Ku now works at a university in Singapore. He's one of many Malaysian doctors who have taken up jobs abroad. Immigration of healthcare professionals is not new. But in recent months, the public healthcare system in Malaysia has come under heavy scrutiny. Long waiting hours at overcrowded emergency departments were attributed to a severe lack of manpower. Many doctors quit, citing post-pandemic burnout and frustration over issues within the system. One such issue stemmed from the surplus of medical graduates in 2016. It led to the introduction of a new hiring system by the government. Medical professionals were hired on contract rather than permanent basis. Contract doctors shared the same workload as their peers on permanent hire, but with lower pay and fewer benefits and postgraduate opportunities. With contracts for an indefinite period, job insecurity has long plagued these young doctors. After a nationwide strike in 2021, the government has since opened up specialisation pathways and offered a handful of permanent posts to these doctors. But today, some 12,000 remain on contract and the crisis-hit healthcare sector is at risk of losing them. Losing even one talent is a big thing for us la, because this talent pool is our talent pool. You know, we train them and we want to train them some more and take over the specialists. If they all leave, we won't have enough specialists in time to come. We won't have enough people to, to, you know, to, to train the next junior level or so. So it's a concern for us. Brain drain cuts across all industries in Malaysia and the number has increased over the years. It is estimated that out of 2 million Malaysians living abroad, one-third comprises highly skilled individuals above the age of 25. Singapore, with its close proximity, remains a primary destination for Malaysians. More than a million are said to be residing there, a fourfold increase over the past four decades. So why is the grass greener abroad? I ask Ryan Chua, a 29-year-old law graduate with a master's degree in public policy. He now works at the regional headquarters of a multinational company in Singapore. A lot of the people around me I know want to leave because they feel hopeless, uh, whether it's because of politics of the past few years or the fact that they feel like things are not on an upward trajectory over here in Malaysia, whether it's for the country or for their own personal growth. They feel that there are better opportunities elsewhere and they are, their talents are more well-valued, they're paid better. Of course, Singapore is uh, considered sort of at the apex of the region and international opportunities in Singapore. Uh, there are quite a lot of them. In 2011, the government set up Talent Corp, 
an agency tasked with attracting and retaining highly skilled talents in the country. But its efforts to regain Malaysian talents have been heavily criticised, particularly the poor uptake of its returning experts programme. We had probably about 10,672 applications over the last 11 years, 6,400 approved. The number is minute, you can see. Uh, but I would like to think that there is quality within that. It's not so much the numbers, but quality, because uh, num many of them that came back are C-suites and technical experts. Once they come here, they create a lot more jobs. And because they are in key positions, they're able to drive investments here. The agency has since expanded its reach to target young minds. Based on a critical occupation list, secondary school students are made aware of talent gaps in the country, while undergraduates are offered structured internship programs to enhance the quality of local talents. And as for the uphill task of regaining those who have moved abroad, all hope is not lost. I've always planned to be abroad for a few years, maybe five years, and that knowledge and network that I've learned and gained, bring it back to Malaysia. Because for me, knowing that this is my home, that this is where I want to build um, my life at, I want to make sure that I'm contributing positively here, I'm trying to do things that help make the lives of either my community or my family or my uh, people here better. So. That for me is uh, a very important thing. I would like to think one day, maybe not now, one day that um, you know, it won't be considered as brain drain, but instead of Malaysia contributing to the world with our you know, diverse talent pool. I think if you build an environment, a system that is resilient, robust enough, um, caring enough, you know, conducive enough, then people would naturally tend to gravitate back to their home, home country. And hopefully that's uh, something that most of us will do one day. Until then, Malaysia's brain drain will continue to be a major obstacle in its pursuit of becoming a high-income nation.